And forgive me, I'm going to have to read this because it's full of quotations which I must get right um, because the, the quotations are all contemporary ones going back in time because the bits that link it are moved, less important. I mean, the first thing to say, there's no evidence that the Chagos were settled before the late 18th century. Um, an Australian multidisciplinary team went and sorted that one out not so long ago. However, many islands, especially Diego Garcia, were rat infested by the time settlement began. So there must have been visits and or wrecks. And I'm sure there were lots of wrecks because the early um, uh, people who surveyed it in the late 18th century talked about there being many wrecks around the coast. <laughs> now this short talk draws on material encountered in studying the archipelago's history. But I should say at the start, the book, when it appears, if ever, ever it appears, won't aim to deal in any systematic way with conservation or the, and the conservation issues. But the other point to make at the start is that few of our sources do so either. What we get are just incidental snippets. We'll start with you had early encounters and what you might call casual predation. The rich marine and bird life was first recorded in 1555 by the Portuguese. One of their vessels was wrecked on one of the 55 islands. We don't know which, but it was isolated and had few trees. And the survivors began by consuming the birds. A survivor tells us that they reduced the population from 10 to 12,000 to about 2,000 in about 25 days. They also constructed a small boat, which they used for fishing with sharks and seals amongst the creatures taken. And not least, they consumed large numbers of turtle eggs. On one occasion, they collected 1,836 of them and then counted them afterwards. As well as some of the turtles, they also came across, came across either to, to lay or while they were laying. Now, a few, few of the people survived to escape to India, but there were some 300 left behind, and they all perished. Not much later, in 1601, the Dutch published a, a chart showing the westernmost island of the archipelago and has been calling it Crab Island. Now, what they had seen was what we now call Egmont, and it's probably no accident that Il Sipai, Coconut Crab Island, <coughs> is to, to this day one of the islets at the extreme western end, where this animal again flourishes. The French took possession of Mauritius early in the 18th century, and by the 1740s, they were systematically exploring the seas and islands lying between Mauritius and France's possessions in India. And one of their concerns was to exploit any natural resources the islands might offer. By 1770, the Intendant, that's the chap in charge of commercial stuff for the French East India Company, had informed his superiors in France that, I quote, turtles are starting to become rare on the island of Rodrigue. It would be as well to leave it alone for a bit so as to allow the creatures time to multiply. And when we get to know the archipelago to the north of these islands better, we may hope to discover some islands just as abundant in turtles as was Rodrigue. Uh, this gent who's called Pierre Poivre was apparently, he's the original model for Peter Piper who picked a peck of pickle pepper. Rem Pierre Poivre remarked that earlier brief sightings of Diego Garcia had indicated an abundance of turtles and proposed that his best officers should be dispatched there in the Belle Saison in order to complete the discovery of the whole archipelago. The first survey showed, and I gain a quote now, its soil cons of Diego Garcia was speaking of, its soil consists of sand on a base of corals and limestone and covered by trees. The only kind of any utility as timber is a sort of beach, not very tall or thick, and suitably only for minor marine purposes. Otherwise, there are just vast numbers of coconut trees. The island abounds in turtles, fish, and two sorts of lobster, marine and terrestrial. On the eastern side, there are some slightly higher sand dunes, up which it appears quantities of turtle climb to lay their eggs. And we observed some huge specimens of these on the reef, as well as many hawksbills in the lagoon. A little earlier, in 1757, a small group of French sailors had been stranded for three months on Salomon. But they didn't know it was Salomon, but we can work it out by the number of islands. 
By the way, we don't believe that the report of this adventure has ever been published before, but it will be soon. These eight men munched their way around its lagoon, consuming many seabirds, also killing seals, whose skins they dried and later used as sails to help effect their escape. And interestingly, the, the leader of this group believed the animals to be dugongs, lanolta in French, but it's been established that he was confused by the term used in Mauritius to describe seals, vaches marines, who by then, which were then already very rare. We may have a, be right to think that some of the small islets given the name of Vash Marine, did indeed harbour seals when first occupied. Indeed, when Lieutenant Archibald Blair first surveyed Salomon in late 1786, he reported that, I quote, we caught 20 turtle, two large seals, and fish enough both for present consumption and salting. But they are not so plenty as at Diego Garcia, probably from the number of seals. He also reported on the bird life. Besides the sea fowl common to the adjacent islands, there's one sort on Salomon which seems peculiar to this cluster. They burrow in the ground and make a noise more disagreeable than a jackal. Curlew and small plover were there in great abundance, but of the latter we shot a great number which were very good. Well, perhaps Pete Carr or another creatures would tell us which were the avian jackals. Soon afterwards, in the mid-1770s, the British also started to take an interest, though more for strategic than commercial reasons. By the time they resolved to settle Diego Garcia, the French had already established a, a small settlement. This included measures to exploit the abundant supply of turtles. There were two paths, one halfway up the eastern limb and one halfway up the western limb, where they cut a track through a jungle, had salt pens on the inside, and they went out to the outer part of the, of the, of the land to collect their turtles. Shortly afterwards, a major expedition was mounted by the British East Indian Company in 1786. One striking feature was the company's concern, I quote now, this important resource must be preserved, talking about turtles, and noting that turtles des desert inhabited places on being much disturbed, we desire, we desire, we will not admit of one single turtle to be turned or caught beyond what will be from time to time immediately wanted for your people, <coughs> nor, in la nor allow their common haunts to be unnecessarily molested. Of course, that instruction didn't stop such activity, but the leader of the expedition made sure it went punished. The leader also reported, I quote, the turtle is to be caught in almost every part of the island, and though from four to five hundred pounds in weight, it's nourishing and far from cloying nor shall care or attention be wanting on our part to prevent the disturbance of these animals that seem to come upon the beach very near the year round, every three or four days. Such numbers might be caught as to provision a few ships were the island clearer and the communication more free, whereas at present we have but two places that roads are made to the outside. <coughs> well, the British quite soon abandoned their, their attempt to settle the island and the French returned. But when war broke out between the two countries in 1793, the Royal Navy was back. William Richardson, a press gang seaman aboard HMS Minerva, described things thus, I quote, this is a noted place for catching turtle, and we found a pen with 200 in it. Our people called se several wild pigs here, which were good eating. In the course of their rambles, several Laskers who were hidden in the woods, hearing our people speak English, came and del delivered themselves up to them. They said they'd been wrecked here in an English ship belonging to Bombay several months ago, and being afraid to deliver themselves up to the French for fear they would have them sent to Mauritius and sold as slaves, they had hid themselves in the woods and lived on coconuts and what else they could find. So we took them all on board, and when we arrived at Bombay, discharged them to their great satisfaction. Having nothing more to draw our attention here, we loaded the brig with turtles and got nearly 50 on board the Minerva and the Bien Aimé, being as many as we could conveniently stow on the main deck between the guns, and then setting fire to the four Frenchmen's hut, huts on what happened to be Guy Fawkes Day, November the 5th, 1793, we got underway and stood out to sea, and each day lived like aldermen on turtle soup. Every evening for near six weeks, a turtle was hung up by the skids, up the skids by its two hind fins and the head cut off to let it bleed 
And though each one was large enough to serve a day for the, our crew of 300 men, scarcely half a pint of blood came from it. Next morning, it was cut up, put into coppers, and when boiled, served out to all hands with two or three bucketfuls of eggs into the bargain. In August 1801, George Collier, captain of Her Majesty's sloop, sloop Victor, put into Diego Garcia in order to refresh his sickly crew, and he too procured a large supply of turtle and good water. Thus, by the end of this initial experience of Homo sapiens, an already marginal population of seals had been given another shove to extinction, while the turtle breeding stocks must also have been given a hard knock, but not one to threaten its survival. We can assume, too, that coconut grabs, however tasty, remained in vast numbers in the dense undergrowth. Well, then, man gets down to business. With the end of the Napoleonic Wars came increased settlement of Chagos, initially under French and then un from 1814 onwards under British sovereignty. Exploitation, not only of turtles, became continuous, not just spasmodic. The population of the Chagos increased steadily during the next century, up to its maximum of 1,200 by 1910. Native mixed woodland yielded to a monoculture of coconuts. To harvest fallen nuts, the ground had to be kept clear of undergrowth in large areas. Inevitably, there followed impoverishment of the previous habitat. The authorities in Mauritius, whether French or British, had an initial recognition of the potential risk. Indeed, the initial concessions under the Crown, known as Rissons, all contained stiffly worded clauses on pain of forfeiture regarding the conservation of trees and turtles. However, supervision of the concessionaires was largely lacking until late in the 19th century. The threat to turtles was also compounded by the belief, which endured for several decades, that the flesh and blood of turtles could help cure leprosy. And because of the animal's supposed abundance, lepers were habitually dispatched to Diego Garcia, where they didn't get it because the slave owners wouldn't have it for them. Uh, to summarize a long story, very few managers of the island plantations took any interest in conservation. Their main concern was to make sure that they garnered any profit that could be made from turtles, whether greens or hawksbills. The latter, increasingly exploited for their shells, became highly profitable as the fashion for tortoise shell took hold in Western Europe. In fact, the species probably only survived as the result of substitution of artificial alternatives, that's say plastics, in the 20th century. Green turtles and their eggs, which provided a welcome change from the staple worker's diet of rice and fish, were much sought after. The worker who caught one would receive six rupees from the manager, and the animals would be held in saltwater pens until required for consumption or export. Relatively small numbers were exported, most were cut up and sold back to the workers for a total of 12 rupees. And let's remember that eight rupees was the basic, basic monthly wage. So there's a lot in it for a chap catching one, and, not, and it, cost, it cost them more than a month's wage to get it, buy it back again. Nor was any protection afforded, afforded to other forms of edible wildlife. Seabirds and crabs, especially the large coconut crabs, were consumed without limit. During the 19th century, individual crabs, as coconut crabs, were carefully crated with a coconut for subsistence and packed off and sent to Mauritius, where they were highly regarded luxury. By the way, at least during the 19th century, little compunction was shown about the way animals were, quote, harvested, unquote. As Charles Darwin noted, Captain Moresby informs me that in the Chagos archipelago, in this same ocean, the natives, by a horrible process, take the shell from the back of the living turtle. It is covered with burning charcoal, which causes the outer shell to curl upwards. It's then forced off with a knife, and before it becomes cold, flattened between boards. After this barbarous process, the animal is suffered to regain its natural element, where, after a certain time, a new shell is formed. It is, however, too thin to be of any service, and the animal always appears languishing and sickly. Well, things did begin to to change, but only towards the 80s, 70s and thereafter, when more thorough investigation of the conditions obtaining in the islands began. Visiting magistrates started to ensure 
that more adequate food, foodstuffs were supplied from Mauritius, and one or two exceptional managers took steps of their own to protect, in particular, birds. The best known was James Spurs, who became manager of the main plantation on Diego Garcia in 1867. Observing the decimation of seabirds, he not only forbade their capture in the three small islets at the mouth of Diego Garcia's lagoon, that's, that's uh, Middle Island, um, but posted sentries there to prevent killing. When the latter themselves took to killing birds, he fined them, only to be told by the visiting magistrate that he had exceeded his authority. But uh, the next magistrate who came along, uh, he therefore dismissed, sorry, dismissed, rejected the penalty which Spurs had imposed on the, on the people who killed the birds on the grounds there was no crime killing a bird. But Spurs had a counterclaim that they had disobeyed his orders not to kill them, and he would find even more for that. Um, but I, Spurs, by the way, was no softy, and as my book will tell you in a little while, could on occasion behave truly brutally. All in all, the commonly held notion that nature's bounty from the sea is inexhaustible was tested to destruction. And while the life then in the Chagos was close to nature, it was certainly not in harmony with it. So we come to the 20th century. By the end of the 19th, work was also in progress in Mauritius on fresh regulations for governing the dependencies. By 1902, a full draft was ready. It included the following, quote, the manager of any dependency may forbid the destruction or attempt at destruction of trees and for a certain time during the year, the killing, selling, taking, or destroying of any wildfowl, seabird, seabird's eggs, turtle, turtle's eggs. And the rules were to be prominently displayed and explained and a penalty of 10 rupees for every offense. I'm sorry to say that all of this stuff had disappeared thanks to pressure from the plantation owners when the regulation was finally promulgated in 1904. Well, in 1903, a naval ship, HMS Pearl, visited the Chagos and reported that in Diego Garcia, quote, green turtles are scarce, owing probably to the eggs not being allowed to hatch out, but being eaten whenever discovered. The captain added, fish are scarce inside the lagoon. Fishermen go out when weather permits. In contrast to Diego Garcia, some medical observers observe, reported in 1908 that Perospanos, that in Perospanos, quote, turtle is plentiful, whereas at Diego Garcia, turtles are somewhat scarce. Now, I did a calculation from the amount paid to Perospanos workers for turtles in 1911, which showed that 143 animals were caught that year in Perospanos. Likewise, also in 1908, contrasting Salomon with the small plantations of Eagle and Egmont, Turtles in the format, say Salomon, are obtained only during a certain season of the year and are rare. While, and there too, seabirds and eggs are not obtainable. That was the same year that Mag Magistrate J Yves Joivet criticized the practice in Diego Garcia of habitual capture of nesting turtles and consuming their unlaid eggs afterwards when the animals were killed. What it, the magistrate said, Whenever a man catches a turtle on the beach, it's always a female, necessarily. A turtle having been upturned, the laborer warns the manager who sends a boat or pirogue to fetch it. My experience is that in almost all the turtles I saw when killed, there was a large quantity of eggs. Now these strictures, I'm sorry to say, resulted only in fresh legislation reinforcing the management view that ownership of all turtles was theirs alone. Quote, the laborers, shall not the laborers shall not appropriate any turtle or hawk's bill, and in case they do either upturn on the beach or spear any such in the sea, the said turtle or hawk's bill turtle shall be taken to be the property of the owners of the islands on payments of so many rupees. And there were prices for females, males, and, and hawk's bill separately, which, they, which were to go to the laborers catching them. <coughs> Moving on in time, towards the end, Figures available from the 1920s show that annual captures of turtles at Eagle Island were in the low single figures over a whole year, with very few at Salomon, 
and compared with 100 or more per year at Perospanos. First evidence comes from Father Dusserk a little bit later, a priest who wrote repeatedly about his missionary work in the Chagos during the 1930s. Well, he was shipwrecked on Eagle Island in 1935, <coughs> and commenting on the shortage of food, he reported that, I quote, seabirds do not nest on eagle, nor do turtles lay their eggs, unquote. He was then taken by a small boat in very rough weather to Perospanos, and there he mentions that many turtles were consumed to make up for the absence of rice, which had gone down with the ship. And while awaiting rescue, Dusserk was taken on a tour of the atoll, which is rather fun to read about, I may say, um, en passant, in the pass next to Yeye Island, they caught masses of what I think must have been, uh, um, what are those big reef fish? And so I'm very easy catching, I'll tell you about that later. Um, sorry, by the way. Um, while awaiting rescue, he was taken on a tour of the island. <coughs> One night was spent in an islet called Coquillage, where all enjoyed a feast of seabirds. And when his boat and others returned to the main island at the end of a week, they brought a vast haul of fresh supplies. I quote, turtles, bananas, birds by the dozen, strung by creepers through the upper bill, birds' eggs by the thousand from many different species, this being the season for egg laying in the open centers of many islets, unquote. And later, he was taken to catch a turtle by night, though on this occasion, only one was successfully speared as it slept on the seabed. Confirming the impression from other sources, Dusserk commented during his visit to Diego Garcia in late 1936, I quote, turtles are really only found at Perospanos, unquote. This wasn't quite the case. During the Second World War, boats were periodically sent to Nelson Island from Salomon, returning with car cargoes of turtle and seabirds. That's when the deliveries became very uncertain during the war. <coughs> so as the 20th century wore on, turtles became even more rare. The trade statistics and visitors' reports hardly mention green turtles, while exports of hawksbill shell hawksbill shell tailed away. An excellent analysis of part, part, has appeared by Jean Mortimer in issue 34 of Chagos News in 2009, <coughs> available on the internet. This showed that the reduction in exports of hawksbill shell resulted mainly from the decline in breeding population. She also reported, as you've first heard, increasingly firm evidence of growing populations of both turtle species in recent years, especially in Diego de Garcia. As regards birds, David Stoddart, who conducted a detailed survey of Diego Garcia in 1967, commented as follows. Whereas, when the islands were first described, colonies of breeding seabirds, particularly terns, noddies, and shearwaters, were important. These have now virtually disappeared on Diego Garcia, and possibly on the other large atolls also. As Pete Carr has testified, that situation too has changed for the better. Well, by way of a coda, this picture here is one done by the captain of a Dutch battleship which sank just off Diego Garcia in 1819. And he had to spend three months there um, before he could get back to Mauritius, during which he did lots of lovely paintings, of which that is one, a picnic with the son of the manager to, to Middle Island, at the mouth of the, mouth of the lagoon, you see the chap climbing, I know that's artistic license up there, but he was a keen collector of, of natural history specimens, which I suppose is all the, the skinned birds you see hanging up, where they had a jolly good meal with lots of, lots of turtle eggs, lots of, sorry, birds' eggs, and lots of birds of different sorts. I think I can see, I think it's a, uh, what's, what's this one here, the black one? It's the frigate bird. It must be more of a specimen than an edible thing. But they spent the night there, um, harassed a bit by, by um, crabs. But they had a very nice time. So that's how it began, and that's, as I've described it, is how it finished. Thank you very much.